And now we are going to welcome Kyle Friedberg from the US. Awesome. Very good. Hello. So my name is Kyle Friedberg. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some of the research that I did uh, about a year ago um, involving a mixed metal sulfate compound. So this whole project began rather by accident. Um, I, was, I was on a bike ride um, in my hometown of Boulder, Colorado, and I found an interesting looking vein of a metal oxide mineral along the side of the road. Um, and so I decided to take a sample of this mineral back to my garage lab um, to analyze it, because these types of minerals typically, um, in this area, they have gold in them. Um, and so I, but what I, when, I, um, when I started to perform a chemical analysis of the mineral, uh, I found something really interesting. Uh, the mineral reacted with sulfuric acid to yield this deep red solution. Um, and if the concentration of sulfuric acid was increased, the color gradually shifted to purple. And so this reaction is, is very uncharacteristic of how a metal, or of how a, a metal oxide mineral would react with acid. Um, and this is what led me to go on um, nearly a year-long journey to try to determine what this compound and solution was. Uh, the first step was simply to try to identify the mineral, uh, which proved unsuccessful. Uh, using a powder X-ray diffraction performed by the USGS, um, so I had to go to um, much more. Uh, I had to uh, do much more work to try to determine what this mineral was. Um, so, through a variety of trial and error methods, I found that by refluxing the mineral in 12, 12 molar sulfuric acid, I was able to leach out some of the impurities. Um, and then I could resuspend the, the leached material in more dilute sulfuric acid and perform what's known as a fractional crystallization, so where you perform repeated crystallizations um, in order to eventually obtain pure crystals of the compound. Um, and with crystals, you're able to use an analysis called single crystal X-ray diffraction um, in order to find the structure. And what this, what this showed is that I discovered a new compound uh, which I called hydrogen ferric manganic sulfate, uh, or just HFMS uh, for short. And it's, it has these, as you can see, it's a, it's a metal sulfate compound uh, with these alternating layers of um, positively and negatively charged um, uh, constituents. And so what, uh, and another, what was very useful is that get, uh, once I had the structure, I was then able to also um, find a, a, a microwave synthesis that was very easily, uh, that was easy and environmentally friendly. Um, and so that now it's, I don't, no longer need to use the mineral to produce it. So some of the potential applications of this compound um, really result from its interesting layered structure. Uh, so a lot of you guys probably in your pockets right now um, have this material here, uh, lithium cobalt oxide, uh, because this is often what is used in um, cell phones, laptops, cameras. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a diagram of how a lithium ion battery works. Uh, so you have, you have lithium ions that go um, in and out of this layer here to transport, uh, in and out of this material to transport charge. Um, and so the, the idea here is that if we go back to the structure of HFMS, you can see it has a very similar layered structure to what's seen um, with a material like lithium cobalt oxide. And so that means it could potentially be um, efficient for um, uh, intercalation of lithium ions, so putting lithium ions in between the layers. Uh, and so it would be interesting to try to create, or to try to use HFMS as a precursor for, um, for creating new um, cathode materials for lithium ion batteries. And then one other application of HFMS that I haven't, um, that I, I hope to work on in the future is um, the fact that it stabilizes water molecules in between the layers, uh, which could present a unique opportunity to, uh, uh, to investigate the mechanism of water oxidation catalysis. So, but 
for me personally, uh, the thing that is most exciting about uh, HFMS is the fact that it is a, um, it's a relatively simple compound, um, and yet it has, um, it is very difficult to, to predict with modern computational methods. Uh, and so, and it's just, it, oops, it, uh, it highlights the fact that there is a lot more work that has yet to be done uh, with simply investigating new compounds. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah, down here. Hello. Hello. Uh, has the idea of using HFMS uh, in lithium ion batteries been explored more? So uh, could it uh, contribute to using less cobalt, for instance, and other dangerous, uh, or not dangerous, but like lacking minerals? Yes, so that is, uh, that's a, a very good observation. So it, for sure, um, obviously cobalt is expensive and it is, um, it's, uh, there's certainly issues associated with using lithium cobalt oxide in batteries. Um, some of the accidents you hear about with uh, lithium batteries exploding from overcharging, that's a result of uh, lithium cobalt oxide. And so the uh, HFMS is very convenient in the fact that both iron and manganese, which are together in the lattice, are uh, very earth abundant. And so that would, so that would certainly be, uh, it would be very useful uh, to do that for sure. Thank you. Yep. Is, there, is there any other question? Yeah, up there, okay. Um, what are the environmental impacts of the pr extraction and refinement of this compound? Okay, good question. Um, so, uh, one thing that's very nice is it's a purely aqueous synthesis. So, there's uh, no solvents needed, um, and the, the compound itself is not relatively non-toxic. Um, and so, there is certainly, um, from this, this process, if this is what you're referring to, um, there is some, there's obviously some acid waste, but that's easily, that can be easily neutralized. So really, there is very low uh, environmental impact uh, in doing this process. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, down here. Oh, okay, so the the second application of the HFMS, it's uh, you said it, it stabilizes H2O molecules between the layers. How how do you mean? What do you mean by that? And uh, what are the applications for that? Okay, uh, great question. Um, so here, so this is a hypothetically oxidized version of HFMS. So this is not a structure that that I have produced yet. But if you look, so if you look at the actual crystal structure, these here um, are hydrogen bonds. Uh, and so you see that these, these water molecules are, so these are actually dihydronium ions in the lattice. Uh, but if you, if you oxidize it, um, you would expect, uh, so if, if one of the metals increases in the oxidation state, then the proton should leave uh, from the layers. And so then you would be able to s still have these waters uh, in the layers, but the what's exciting is how close together the waters are, um, because in water oxidation, uh, you want the water to be close together so that the oxygens can bond um, and the protons can fly off. So, great question. Thank you. Okay, I think there were two more questions over there, down here. Could you maybe raise again your arm? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I was just wondering, like, um, how much of this uh, is it HFMS? Uh, is there like, uh, is there more of it than um, like cobalt, for example? Like, it could is it like, can you make it yourself? Like, it does it like run out after a while? Like, I don't know. My my question might be a bit. No, clear. that's good. Um, so, uh, as I so if you go. Here, so I actually came. So initially, um, I had some set amount of rock that I was using to make this, um, and so obviously it was it was limited at the time. But then once you're able to identify it with the structure, it's very helpful because then you can start coming up with trying to come up with a method to synthesize it without having to use a rock. Uh, and so the method to synthesize it is actually very easy, um, and it takes you just mix together a couple of chemicals, pop it in the microwave and nuke it for a couple minutes. So <laughs> it's like making a, baking a potato, really. Uh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so one of the most essential properties for a battery, especially nowadays where there's like uh, many new ideas for batteries being produced uh, coming forth, is that it's able to survive for many cycles and it's able to like effectively produce charge and like that is able to last very long. Do you know how? Can you predict how well this would last? OK, so uh, that I 100% agree with you that I think one of the biggest issues of the future is trying to come up with batteries that last longer. Um, and I really do think that that's what's going to revolutionize renewable energy, is coming up with batteries that have a much longer cycle life. Because um, then you can invest in them, big companies can invest in them, um, and it can be used. And so uh, HFMS, I have not, so in order to try to look at that, I would have to do um, uh, most likely DFT, so density functional theory calculations um, on this, and I haven't done those yet. So I can't actually predict the cycle life. Okay. But great question. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, now you have time to make...